Zvezda TV Network presents May 2017, Syria, the Khmimim Air Base. A counter-terrorist operation begins. Aircraft loaded with bombs and missiles rise into the air. Nearby, in camouflaged Kungs, stationed close to the runway, people are quietly working. It is the UAV ground control station. On their screens, the camera feeds from the reconnaissance drones, used to be the armed forces only application for the UAVs. But now begins the new era. Russia has developed its first heavy combat drone, the UCAV Okotnik. You're watching Combat Approved. We're opening this episode in the Aktubinsk-based State Flight Test Center, the testing ground for this magnificent vehicle. The Russian UAV recognized worldwide as one of the best. The most modern, the most powerful, one-of-a-kind aircraft. Our protagonist for today. On Combat Approved, we wanted to talk about this aircraft for a very long time. Today, we'll finally be able to show its 3D woven composite airframe, the first Russian engine with flat nozzle, the flight tests of the first version of the Okotnik, and the development of the second version of the Sukhoi UCAVs. All of this on Combat Approved. Combat Approved. Ostrakhan Oblast, Aktubinsk. One of the most highly classified military facilities in Russia, the Chkalov State Flight Test Center. It was here that the Okhotnik made its maiden flight. For its engineers, today is just like any other day just another aircraft test. For us, though, it's a special occasion. It's the first time we see the drone in person. We were even allowed to mount on its wings. The top-down footage clearly shows the difference between the two latest Sukhoi aircraft. The Su-57 is smaller, designed as a conventional fighter. The Okotnik UCAV is built as a flying wing. This design has some unique features. First, the shape. It's a triangle, which ensures maximum stealth. Second, the size, which provides enough space to carry all the required weaponry. Third, there's no cockpit. In its place, there's an air inlet. Fourth, there's no empennage. Fifth, the engine. Unlike on the Su-57, there's only one with one nozzle. Pre-flight preparations for the drone. Is it very different from preparing, for example, its brother, the Su-57? It's not very different in terms of the vehicle itself. In terms of the avionics, the difference is the communications checkup. It's much more thorough here. Communications are essential for any drone. When an ordinary non-military drone loses connection to its remote control, it usually just either returns to the base or hangs in the air until the battery runs out and it falls to the ground. For the large and expensive combat drone, this is unacceptable especially when it's in the combat situation with jammers all around. That's why checking communications before takeoff is so important. Right now, it's controlled from where? It's controlled from the ground control station. This is what's happening inside the station. The pilot's already taken his place. He remotely prepares the vehicle for testing. We'll talk later about his job. Let's see the vehicle itself. 
The purpose of today's testing is to try out the new on-the-ground braking algorithm. In particular, the acceleration-deceleration algorithms. This vehicle is now a test lab. We're assembling a new testing prototype. Meanwhile, this one is for testing acceleration-deceleration algorithms. As you've just heard, this aircraft is a flying lab, and also the current testing prototype. So it differs in many ways from the Okotnik we'll see in service. This second, improved version was first shown on August 5, 2021. The aircraft in the assembly stage was demonstrated before the Minister of Defense. We're expecting the work on the project to be finished by 2022, after which, as is currently standard in the armed forces, we'll be signing a large-scale, long-term contract for the UAVs. This footage was filmed in Novosibirsk at the Chkalov plant, the plant where they assemble the Su-34 bombers, among other things. Now they've started working on the Okotnik too. To be more precise, only the final assembly of the drone is taking place in Novosibirsk, the bigger picture is that the whole country is involved in this project, in the best traditions of the military industry. Composite airframe components are manufactured in the Kaluga Oblast in Obninsk. The engines are developed at the Moscow Luka Design Bureau, tested in Litkarin near Moscow, assembled in Ufa at the largest plant in Bashkiria. The Okotnik's control unit comes from Moscow. And of course, the brain behind this complex operation, the Sukhoi Design Bureau, is in the capital. To jump ahead for a moment, Combat Approved will be visiting all these plants. You'll see in detail how the country's most powerful drone is assembled. You may be wondering why, out of the large number of Russian UAVs, we've singled out the Okotnik. The Russian armed forces have begun R&D into drone technology long ago. On Combat Approved, we've shown the Orlan, the Takion, the Corsar, the Orion. We've even shown strike drones, for example, a kamikaze drone from the Kalashnikov concern, or the brainchild of the Ural works of civil aviation designers called Altair. But the Okotnik is something else entirely. It is a full-fledged, large aircraft with a jet engine, with formidable armament safely hidden in the fuselage. Russian aviation manufacturers first announced their plans to develop a vehicle of this kind at the MOX 2009, but settling on a definite design ideology and features took some time. The aircraft itself was first seen only in 2018. The aircraft was only shown on the ground that time. The first flight took place a year later, on August 3, 2019. This footage made a lot of buzz around the world. The steady power-up, the smooth rotation. Then, 20 minutes in the skies, geared down. When Combat Approved was given permission to film the aircraft, it already had 20 hours of flight time. 20 whole hours. Think about it. For a newly developed aircraft with a completely new design, every flight counts. And since the prototype has been given this new test lab role, it will now have to endure a series of challenging and dangerous flights beyond anything the production versions will have to encounter. So the purpose of today's flight is to test the braking system, yes? Not so much the braking system, but the braking and deceleration algorithms. Since this vehicle is not equipped with a drogue parachute, and landing weight and landing velocity can be quite high, working out and optimizing the deceleration algorithm is very important in order to get the required takeoff and landing characteristics. This is the Su-57 landing with a drogue chute and without. You'd think there's nothing more to test. All these systems have been tested before on the 5th gen fighter. But no, the Okotnik and the Su-57 may be brothers, but they're not twins. Because this vehicle has a fundamentally different landing gear arrangement than the Su-57, that is, the track is wider and the wheelbase is shorter, it presents some challenges for taxiing algorithms. 
and especially for landing deceleration algorithms. Strictly speaking, the official name of the new UAV is not the Okotnik, but the S-70B-1, the brainchild of the Sukhoi DB. This aircraft incorporates the strengths the DB is famous for. The DB that developed the Su-25, the main attack aircraft of the Soviet Army. The first Soviet large fourth-gen fighter, Su-27. The first fifth-gen fighter, Su-57. And now, the first large UAV, S-70. This is not the first time that Combat Approved has been in this building of the Sukhoi DB. Here, they develop information and control systems, or the ICS for short, and as you know, the ICS is the brain of modern aircraft. Here, we filmed the brain of the Su-35, as well as the brain of the Su-57. And now, it is time to get inside the brain of the Okotnik. Once again, here we meet the chief designer of the Okotnik program. What's the main difference between the ICS of the Okotnik and the Su-57, for example? The main difference between the information and control system, and that's exactly what we have behind us, which is, yes, in this room, at least its development lab, the main difference from similar systems for manned aircraft is that it is much more intelligent. This extra intelligence is justified. The S-70 is a drone, and as we've said, it has to be able to function even with the communications breakdown. In such situations, the vehicle should be able to decide what to do on its own. It ensures autonomy for the aircraft, so it can, for example, safely return to the base. So the ICS here is inherently smarter than on the Su-57? It is, in terms of ensuring autonomous functionality. It can functionally replace the whole flight crew. So in case there's a comms failure, you're saying it's an ordinary situation? Well, put it this way. It's a planned-for situation. So the Okotnik is not just a drone. It's also a robot. And it's smart. Look at all this complex structure. But this, too, is an Okotnik. It's an Okotnik stripped of its engine and its fuel system, as well as its airframe, weapons, and avionics. The only thing left here is just the control system of half of the aircraft. So, if we're saying that the ICS, the Information and Control System, is the brain of the Okotnik, the control system is... It's the cerebellum, the spinal cord, and the muscles of the aircraft. And if a person has arms and legs and a car has wheels, what does the Okotnik use to control its motion? It uses three sections of the elevons and the spoilers. Is this a classic scheme for the flying wing? Well, in principle, it depends on the school of design. So we believe that for this aircraft, this control configuration is optimal. The view from above clearly shows these controls. Here are the spoilers. Along the edge are the elevons, two outer, two middle, and two inner ones. There's no empennage on this machine. Therefore, the elevons are used to turn left or right. The Okotnik is a big drone, so in order to get a grasp of the control system, we have to climb onto the stand. What's this one? This is the actuator for the outer section of the elevon. Next, this. This, together with those components, make up the spoiler actuator. This one. This is the actuator for the middle elevon section, and this is the actuator for the inner elevon section, and this is the actuator for the front landing gear. How much does what we see here at the stand match the Okotnik we filmed in Oktubinsk? These are all the components of the control system of that plane. So, 100%? 100%. On this stand, the drone's control system is not hidden away in a compact shell, but laid out as clearly as possible for examination and testing. Here, the designers work out what can be improved, changed, reconfigured. How similar is this to the Okotnik that will go into production? The Okotnik will be put into production, taking into account all the expertise we gained during the R&D on the first vehicle. 
There will be components optimized for this particular aircraft and its role, so they will be a bit different from what we have on the first version. So many components will be designed specifically for the Okotnik, not lifted from existing fighters? Yes, absolutely. This stand has an interesting history. It's always got very unusual vehicles. At one point, it was used to test the control system of the Su-47 Berkut. It's quite a task to make an aircraft with a forward sweep wing, where the wing is figuratively speaking put backwards, fly properly. And in the case of the Okotnik, it's necessary to ensure the flight of an aircraft which has no wings at all. Or rather, the aircraft itself is the wing. Does the fact that we are dealing with a drone, not a conventional aircraft, make the control system more complex? The complexity of the control system depends, in general, of course, on the aerodynamic design. That is, the more control surfaces an aircraft has, the more actuators it has to have. And consequently, the more complex the control algorithms become. But as far as I understand, the aerodynamic design here is more straightforward than, for example, the Su-57. It does have its own features, which the Su-57 in turn does not. It's no mistake that we compare the two aircraft so often. They are designed to work both individually and in tandem. What's more, this first tandem flight has already happened. This is how it went. The fifth gen fighter was the first to take the skies. It made several circles over the airfield and waited for the drone to take off. In a combat scenario, the Su-57 will operate in a safe zone where it cannot be reached by ADMS, acting as a repeater, while the Okotnik, or rather several Okotniks, will go on the attack, still maintaining maximum stealth. We are standing next to the Su-57, which is a fifth-gen fighter. How accurate is it to say that the Okotnik was built or designed based on it? It's not quite accurate to say that. It would be more accurate to say that the aircraft, in this case the S-70B-1, which was designed in its time under the Okotnik program, used individual solutions and technologies refined on the Su-57, and some of the systems from the Su-57, such as? Such as, well, we can clearly see when the aircraft stand side by side, that the landing gear struts are identical. This is because the timing of the development for this aircraft was very tight. Another key similarity is the aircraft's engines. The two aircraft share the same jet engine. The only difference is that the fighter has thrust vectoring nozzles and the drone does not. Here, we don't need thrust vectoring at all? Here, thrust vectoring would be redundant because this aircraft was not designed to have supermaneuverable capabilities. We need to consider tactical considerations here. Supermaneuverability is useful to evade cruise missiles in close combat. Fighters such as the MiG-29, Su-27, Su-30SM, Su-35, Su-57 all have this capability. But the S-70 Okotnik has a different mission. It has to quietly sneak into the enemy's rear and drop its payload on its positions, then just as quietly return to base. It does not need to spin in loops. It has other strengths. We see that along with the control system stand, you've also installed the pilot seat. Am I calling it right? The operator's station. Operator station. What is it here for? Well, since the main purpose of this setup is to test the aircraft controls, we simulate and use real control elements in our test stand, including those used by an operator. On the screen, the aircraft's flying over a city then over woods and hills. Then the operator turns toward the sea. An attentive viewer will notice that the simulated model on the operator's screen looks nothing like the Su-70. We are told it doesn't matter here. 
We use an existing model because it's just to make it easier for the operator to understand the attitude of the aircraft. But the operator of a real Okhotnik doesn't have the same luxury of having an outside view of the aircraft. He sees what the Okhotnik's eyes see, doesn't he? Well, yes. He only has images from the cameras. Not much, of course, but still quite enough to control the vehicle. HIL simulations are a prerequisite for the real test flights. Here, all flight modes can be tested without any danger to the pilot or the aircraft. There's another major difference between what we see here and a video game. Look, any operator inputs are immediately transmitted to those mechanisms, which immediately start moving. What does that tell us? The mechanisms precisely perform the control system commands just as in real flight. So, from the movements of the physical controls and the response of the simulated vehicle, we can assess how well the vehicle's control algorithms work. Well, enough staring at the monitors. Let's see the real thing. We're once again in Oktubinsk, where our protagonist is getting ready to take the runway. And now for the most interesting question. How is the drone controlled? A ground control station, or GCS for short, is built specifically for it. It is a small khaki-colored container that houses the crew. The drone's crew during the test phase is three people. This is the pilot operator, the navigator operator, and the communications operator. The pilot operator monitors all of the aircraft's operating parameters, including the video feed from the two cameras that come up on these two monitors. At the moment, they are turned off. We ask what the three of them do when the drone operates in autonomous mode, flying unassisted. In this case, it becomes an autonomous aircraft that operates without the pilot's intervention, so the pilot and the crew just monitor the system's functions and parameters. And in this situation, it takes off by itself and knows how fast and how far it needs to go? It knows the necessary speed. It automatically controls it, and in this mode, it performs its mission fully autonomously. The more time we spend in the GCS, the less like a video game it feels. So now, another combat-approved exclusive. If this were an episode about the Su-57, for instance, this would be the most exciting moment. Imagine yourself, right here in the cockpit. This is just like that. The drone is preparing for takeoff. So we are asked not to distract the pilot for the time being. The engine will be powering up in just a few seconds. Everyone is waiting for the drone to start rolling. The controls, as you can see, look a lot like in a classic fighter. But there are two screens on top where the windshield would be. In order not to distract the pilot, and more importantly, not to reveal some of the secrets, we are asked to go outside especially as the Okotniks already made its way to the runway of the Chkalov State Flight Test Center. So we carry on the chase. We quickly get into the car with one of the engineers of the ground crew. It turns out this car always accompanies the drone during takeoff at this test phase. The task is to quickly report the problem to the control station operator in the event of an emergency. But nothing like that is happening today. We can see the drone moving confidently and precisely on the runway, accelerating and braking. It turns smoothly and safely within the runway area. Hard to believe there's no one inside at that moment. This happens a couple of times, but still no takeoff. We are reminded that flying wasn't supposed to be part of today's test. Remember the task for the day? It was testing the new on-the-ground braking algorithm. No more than that. Well, there's the end of this, so to speak, flight. Ground maintenance begins, just like on a normal aircraft. The tug comes around, all the flaps are closing. 
At least we can't film anything inside. It's true. The Okotnik has too many parts and components that are restricted to the public, even though this is a prototype and not a production model. Our protagonist, meanwhile, safely returns to the park. It's time to evaluate its performance. The crosswind conditions originally stated in the flight plan did not correspond to the true wind speed on the runway. Strong winds today? Strong winds today. I think you could feel it. This is the kind of microphone we use for windproofing, so we can also confirm that the wind is quite strong today. A few more minutes go by. The drone is finally parked, and then the engine is switched off. Who do you think actually did that? The pilot, of course. It's time we met him. This is Yevgeny Frolov, Hero of Russia, National Award Laureate. He's been involved in the Okotnik program for more than eight years. Much of what you see in this cockpit was his idea. We have two forward-looking cameras on the aircraft. They are completely separate. They have completely independent communication systems. This is for redundancy, in case something goes wrong with one of them. They double each other? Yes, they are identical. Next, there's, of course, all the piloting information required. And then there is the tactical situation display. Here will be the ground control when taxiing. Here we have a standard PFD, the same as on any other combat aircraft. And the same, so to speak, information field to monitor the functioning of the aircraft systems. Worth mentioning that honored test pilot Frolov is a traditional test pilot. The Okotnik is the first time in his long career that the aircraft takes to the skies with the pilot left on the ground. What aircraft have you tested before this one? Well, what haven't I tested? Almost anything in the air today. So such planes as... Well, it's not that easy to recall any in particular. There were more than 70. Practically anything that flies today. And so after those 70 comes this 71st. Big difference? Yes, it's quite different. In what way? First of all, the aircraft's flying somewhere in the skies and you're sat here on the ground. Disconnect? Yes, when you're in the cockpit, you're feeling the aircraft. It's like a sixth sense. And here you're not. You're just looking at the monitors. You know, it's like in a car there. You brake, you feel it. You speed up, you feel it. You turn, you feel every little motion of the aircraft. If you fly long enough, you can feel the motion before it shows on the instruments. But here, you always have to stay alert and monitor the instruments. On Combat Approved, we've filmed many great pilots, such as Commander of the Striji Sergei Osaikin, Commander of the Ruski Vityazi Andrei Alexeyev, Commander of the Berkuts Andrei Popov. And no matter their preference, aircraft or helicopter, every one of them told us about this sixth sense. Just imagine depriving a pilot of this sense. It's like depriving a cook of their sense of smell or a sniper of their sight. And so we wondered, why not bring back that feel of speed, of steep banks, of g-forces, since modern simulators can do all of it? Maybe the pilot seat with the drone controls should be equipped with these systems. No, well, it's very different here. The fact that, say, there's manual control here, it's purely temporary, just for testing purposes, just in case. So when it goes to the military, there won't be any of this? No, there won't. It won't be there because the drone has to do everything autonomously. So it won't even be necessary to have all these skills anymore. You heard right. The whole fighter cockpit-like setup, the control stick, it's all just for the duration of the tests. The production Akotnik will be just like that. The operator's not supposed to pilot the vehicle. Their job is just to monitor the flight. That's all. Set a task for the drone and watch how it carries it out. It has to be able to do everything on its own. Even if it loses contact with me, it finishes the route by itself, returns to base and lands. If something goes wrong, it switches into emergency mode. 
it does have an emergency mode, where it also autonomously returns and lands. I just have to monitor. So there are several layers of fail-safe measures? Yes, there are quite a lot of safeguards and safety features that ensure its functionality. We ask, if the drone is to be so highly autonomous, why do we need pilots to fly it? Wouldn't it be better to bring in kids with video game experience? We wonder just what the first Okotnik operators in the military would look like. Well, I think they'll most likely start with former pilots and then see how it goes. There are studies by the Americans, and they're even saying that it's not necessary to bring in operators with flight training. But that's their opinion. I think a certain operational period has to pass before we see if flight training is necessary or if operator skills are enough. As for the Americans, they have long had aircraft built using the flying wing design. A classic example, the B-2 strategic bomber built using stealth technology. This footage was filmed in Tver at the Central Research Institute of the Aerospace Forces. Here, our scientists in uniform are tackling a difficult problem, to make visible what is considered invisible. To do this, they make all these scale models, including the B-2, the F-117, the Americans thought this aircraft was invisible, but because here in Tver they figured out how to spot this aircraft long ago, the Serbs managed to shoot the invisible one down. When was the model delivered here? This model? Well, about 10 years before it was first demonstrated. No way! In these 10 years, we examined and tested it and generated the necessary data. There's no such thing as invisibility. Well, this one is less reflective than other aircraft. What, you may ask, does the Okotnik have to do with any of this? We'll explain. Our military institutes, having mastered seeing the invisible, are also solving the opposite problem, helping to create a design for the new drones that will make the aircraft as stealthy as possible. Look at this range of radars. In terms of radar technology, you're looking at the exact replica of all, absolutely all, NATO radars. Thanks to these, we are able to look at the Okotnik through the eyes of a potential enemy. This is the place where journalists are rarely allowed. Moreover, the stand we are going to work with is the only one in the country. What is it called? The Yegorovets. It's designed to assess the radar visibility of weapons and military equipment, both on the ground and in the air. Now we're in Voronezh, the Zhukovsky Gagarin Air Force Academy. Today, the test subject on the stand is the Orlan reconnaissance drone. And before that, the 5th Gen Su-57 fighter took a spin on it. In summary, the Su-57 is one of the world's stealthiest aircraft of its class, due in no small part to the Academy's scientists. Obviously, the Okotnik had to pass a similar stealth test, and when we call its shape triangular, we did not mention the main point. This triangle is relative. Its three sides can only be observed from above. From the side, it's more of a hill shape, and a rather complex one. This is combat approved, and we are showing you Russia's most powerful combat drone. You'd be surprised, but this is it as well, or rather an incomplete replica of it. Or even more precisely, the master model needed to make the mold tooling. So these outlines are 100% matched to the Okotnik? Absolutely. We'll discuss later how parts of the Okotnik's airframe are assembled from resin and fibers. For now, let's start with how these complex designs are calculated, combining shapes like parabolic hyperboloids and hyperbolic paraboloids. For this, we head back to the Sukhoi DB. In front of us, let's look at the door, the Sukhoi SCTRC Supercomputer Partnership Team. Why was it necessary to involve your supercomputer team before the first flight of the Okotnik? 
This aircraft is special. It's new for the country and for the company as well. So we had to use the maximum number of computational studies, high precision simulations for the most critical modes of the aircraft, landing modes, various failures scenarios. This made it possible to approach the first flight with more confidence. Before the first flight, these young talents did the colossal job and created a mathematical model of the Okotnik to predict and study how it would behave in an emergency. What emergencies were you tackling? Well, the most critical modes are the approach and landing. So we looked at engine failure, engine mode in auto rotation, control failures, coupled failures, multiple failures in instrument system components. Here's one such emergency. The Okotnik approaches the runway, drops the landing gear, and then the engine fails. Red on the screen indicates an area of high wind stream pressure. And there's another unpleasant scenario, flight controls failure. To what extent do these models correlate with what could, God forbid, happen in a real-life situation? The model is high precision. It's validated. So in the air, it'll be the same as shown here. Really? So you're absolutely confident in your work? That's what I get paid for. Now consider this. Thanks to these mathematical flights, in the development of the Okotnik, it was possible for the first time ever to skip building entire test stands. The firefighting system stand, for example, used to always be built, and only in the case of the Okotnik was it possible to forgo this stage, again, for the first time ever. We conducted and reconstructed experiments carried out on the Su-35 and Su-57, which showed that the models correctly describe the physical processes that are characteristic of such stands. The resulting methodology was carried over, resulting in a mathematical model that confirmed that the fire extinguishing system had been designed correctly. We need to note that without such calculations, the first flight would simply be forbidden. Impossible. It's forbidden, yes. It usually takes three to five years to test fire extinguishing systems, but in this way, they manage to do it in just six months. Well, to conclude this episode, we have to say that all these complex calculations were done not just by a computer, but by the the supercomputer installed at the Russian Federal Nuclear Center, which did many hundreds of calculations, allowing us to approach the first flight of that aircraft with confidence. The most powerful computer in the country. That's right. How long did it take to calculate these models? Two months. And if it were the standard timeline? Dozens of years. Out of all Russian drones, the Okotnik is the only one built using Russia's most powerful supercomputer. As we said, it is a very special aircraft. That's all for this episode. There will be a second episode about Russia's most technologically advanced UAV, where we'll show you how it's built. With polymer fibers and heat-resistant resins, a brand new nozzle, and the engine concealed behind it. All of it, only on Combat Approved.